So <clears throat> it's baseball season, right? Yeah. As a Mariner, I still enjoy baseball. It's all right, right? It's all right. So, yeah, baseball season. But, it, it, you know, if you're going to play baseball, I don't know, how many has played, actually played baseball? Any, anyone in here? A few of you, maybe? Yeah, softball, okay, that counts. Okay, it's, Yeah, it's a little different, but it, it counts. So, yeah, baseball, softball, yeah, okay. So there, it, the way I see it, there's basically three things that we need, three, 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 three items that you have to have in order to play baseball, okay? The, the first thing you have to have is you have to have a glove, right? I mean, yeah, I suppose you could play baseball without a glove, but you, yeah, it might create some pain, um, you know, it might uh, be a short-lived, you know, career <laughs> playing baseball, you break a hand or something, yeah. So, yeah, you need a glove, right? It, it kind of, you know, extends your hand, makes it a little bit bigger than just, you know, what God's given us, you know, you got a little extra, uh, but also got a lot of padding in it, right? You know, so, you know, when that ball is coming really fast, you know, it, it kind of helps to cushion the blow into our hand, right? Uh, the next thing we need to play baseball is you, you need uniform, right? Because there's two teams, right? And so you got to know what team you're on. You know, I, I've been, you know, in the field before and, 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 you know, I maybe got late to the game or whatever and I just kind of run out on the field and, and I'm out there and the, and the inning ends and we get the third out and, and I go, wait, where, where's my dugout? Which, am I third baseline or first baseline, right? And, and so it's helpful to have a uniform because I see my guys in my dugout. So, I, oh, that must be mine because there's a bunch of guys with my uniform, right? So you need to have a uniform so you can tell which team you're on. And then I think the last thing you need to play baseball is you need a bat. Right? Uh, I mean, you could try hitting it with your hand, but again, that, that creates some pain that probably nobody likes, um, and especially if you're throwing it really fast in there, it could be painful, right? So uh, anyway, so we need to have a bat so you can, you know, hit the ball. And this is three things that actually God gives us as well. He, he gives us a glove, he gives us a uniform, and he gives us a bat in this game of life that we are in. The, the, the battle that we are in is, is real. And, and over the last few weeks, um, in the, my messages, I recognize that it's been maybe difficult for us to walk through this. And a few weeks ago, I was talking about this battle between good and evil. And, and that we have evil people doing evil things to us. Sometimes, just because, you know, that happens. But oftentimes, as Christians, we may feel and experience a little bit more of that. And, and, and what God tells us is that if we're Christians and we're going to live his way, that when we experience evil, our job is to do good in return. That, that even our enemies, we would not seek to hurt or to harm or to do evil to them, but that we would do good to them. Now, that, that's, that's a hard thing that God is asking us to do. I mean, everything inside of us is, is telling us that when we get treated poorly, we want to treat them poorly. We want to lash out. We want revenge. We want to hurt them like they've hurt us. That's just kind of the natural reaction. And, and sometimes we, we face significant pain and suffering and persecution and evil in this world. And it just doesn't make sense for us to say, oh, well, I should respond with good. But that's what God calls us to do. It's hard. But, you know, even for those of us that can maybe get our minds around the idea of doing good to those who are evil, uh, evil to us, we, we could kind of we kind of justify it in the sense that, you know, we kind of feel like maybe if we do good enough to these evil people in our life who keep doing evil things to us, that maybe eventually it'll have, you know, some benefit to it, that it'll kind of work out and maybe they'll finally realize what they're doing and they'll start treating me better, right? That they'll treat us better and do good things to us instead of continuing to do evil. But Peter, in the next lesson that we look through, in the next passage, he says, no, 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 you need to understand that even if you do good to evil people, it is not going to necessarily change their behavior. A matter of fact, oftentimes when we do good to people, we get even more evil in return. And so he says, I don't want you to do this for the wrong reasons. He says, I don't want you to be good to evil people thinking or hoping that someday they're going to treat you well because you've treated them well. He says, no, no, think about even Noah. He says, Noah, who, who preached to this most evil generation of all time, 
For years and years while he built this ark, he's telling them that God's judgment is coming. They need to repent. They need to, you know, recognize their sin. And not one person converted. Not one person believed him. All he got was ridicule and attack and evil from that generation over and over and over again. So, so Peter, again, you know, he just kind of wipes out this mindset that, well, maybe if we just do good, then eventually the evil people will be good to us. So that's hard too. So now it's like, oh, I mean, it's not, even if I do evil the rest of, or good to, to the evil the rest of my life, it's not going to maybe, it's not going to change anything. It's, matter of fact, the evil may just continue to pile on and get worse. And then last week, I talked about the fact that, you know, Peter goes into this section where he says, well, you know, we need to actually follow Christ into suffering. That it's not just the, su- the suffering that we endure is not just going to come from without. It's not just going to become because people are evil to us. But if we're going to follow Jesus, that means that sometimes we have to willingly step into pain. So three difficult things for us to come to grips with and, and actually live out because there doesn't seem like there's a lot of encouragement there. But I think Peter recognized that. And then he gives us this passage today. A passage that I think is is filled with encouragement. Peter wants to encourage us. He says, I know I've just laid some heavy stuff and pain and suffering and evil and it's going to be hard. But he says, I want you to understand what we have. I want you to understand, he says, I I want you to understand that you were not alone in this. That we have a God who recognizes the pain, has experienced the pain himself, but understand that he is still with us. And so Peter lays out for us three ways, three things that God provides for us in this life that we're living, in this battle that we're walking through. God gives us first knowledge, second companionship, and finally he gives us power. So let's read 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 7 through 11, our passage for today. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So first, God gives us knowledge. He gives us knowledge specifically of the future. The end is near. <laughs> this end is near is, is, is not meant for billboards. The, the end is near is not meant for sandwich boards. This is not the way that we call people to Christ. The end is near. The end is near is for us, his family, to let us know that, it's, that the suffering we're enduring, the evil that we are receiving from this world, that it's limited in time. We, we don't have to be here forever. It's not going to last forever. The end is near. This is good news. This is great news. God is giving us the future He's saying, look, the future is coming. The end is near. The kingdom of God is coming. This battle that we're in against pain and suffering is limited. The eternal kingdom is coming. When this knowledge is revealed, I I think we receive two things from it. When we really understand that the end is near, and our time here is limited, and that we won't have to endure this suffering for eternity. 
we, we, we do two things. First, we loose our grip of today. We, we recognize that the defeats and even the victories that we enjoy or have to endure are only temporary. And so we, we loose the grip of today, that, that we're not so concerned about those victories or those defeats. We, we recognize that there's something bigger that we're playing for, that it's a bigger deal that we're looking towards, that it's not just, you know, our hope is not wrapped up in what happens here. Our hope is not wrapped up in other people treating us well. Our hope is not wrapped up in us, you know, not having any pain or being in total comfort or just enjoying, you know, life to the full. That's not where our hope lies. Our hope lies in eternity. And when we understand that, we begin to hold this world loosely and recognize that the pain and the suffering that we endure, it's limited and it's okay because I won't have to endure it forever. An illustration is given, but consider this wall, this tan wall. We had a debate in the first service about this color of this wall. I don't know. What color is that? It's brownish, tannish, whatever. Anyway, this wall, imagine this wall goes on forever, never ends representing the line of eternity. It begins, though, right here at the corner. Our life in this world stops right in that corner. That's all we have to endure. The rest of it is all of eternity, where there will be no sin, no pain, no suffering. It's all good stuff, right? And so, so, so often we get stuck in the corner and that's all that we see and we get defeated and we get, we get depressed and we get concerned and we, just, we get despair because we're in the corner. But we need to get our eyes off the corner and look at eternity because that's where we're going to spend it. The time we have here is limited. And when we understand that, we have a loose grip of what's today, but we have a firm grip of what's tomorrow. We grab onto that and we hang on to it for dear life because that is where our hope is found. That is where we're looking to. That's what we're hoping. That's where everything is about that. Everything we do today is about what's going to do in eternity, what we can do for eternity, how we can pr proceed in this life in order to enjoy more of eternity, even maybe some of eternity today, somehow. This is the baseball glove that God gives us. And here's what I mean by that. With a baseball glove, we stop baseballs. That's what you do on defense. The ball's hit. If it's a ground ball, you stop it. If it's a fly ball, you catch it, right? But the baseballs that life sends to us, that hits our way, it's not, not designed to stay in the glove. You know, when we catch it, we get that ground ball, we've got to throw it. We've got to get rid of it as soon as possible to get it to first base to get the out. If we catch the fly ball, we don't hang on to it there either, right? We throw it to the pitcher or to, to our other teammate or whatever, but we get rid of the ball. You don't hang on to that forever. The baseballs that life hits at us are not meant to be hung on to. They're meant to be thrown back. But the baseball that God hits our way of eternity, it's basically this. It's, it's, it's the game ball. At the end of every game, we go into the dugout, and the coach comes out and he says, all right, I want to give out a game ball for the one who did the best, had the best play today or whatever. And you know what you do when you get a game ball? When you get a game ball, you put it in your glove and it stays there. Put it in your glove, you put it in your bag, that's your game ball. Keep that there. And this, this, is, this is an illustration of our life here when we understand eternity. The baseballs that life hits at us, we throw back. The game ball that we get from our father, that's the one we keep in the glove and hang on to. So we need to place our hope in eternity, again, where there's no sin, right? The eternal kingdom, no sin. It's a love relationship that we get to experience to the fullness, right? right? Here we get to experience a relationship with God, that intimate love relationship that he has with us, but we don't always get to experience the whole thing. When we get to the eternal kingdom, we get the whole thing. We get to enjoy the rest of eternity. It's going to be filled with joy and happiness and goodness. Revelations 21, verses 1 and 2. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of, the heaven, out of heaven from God. This is our hope. This is that new heaven 
that we're looking for, that is coming down to us. It's an eternal kingdom. And, and here's the thing, you know, I, I'm, it's, I'm amazed sometimes. I have conversations with Christians, and I, we start to talk about heaven sometimes. And, and, and sometimes I'm amazed because they'll, they'll say to me, some people have said to me in the past, you know, heaven's going to be great, but, you know, I kind of hope that God doesn't, Jesus doesn't come back too soon because there's some things that I want to do in this life. You know, there's a few things that I haven't experienced yet that I would like to experience, you know, and, and, I, and I think for us Americans, maybe this is more, we're more susceptible to this than, than others, but because, you know, we have such good life sometimes. Maybe our life isn't filled with pain. We're, we're, you know, life is comfortable and it's easy and there's a lot of good things in this world to enjoy. And so we begin to have this perspective of heaven that, yeah, it's great, but you know what? I kind of like what I'm doing here. And I think it's because we just have this small view of heaven. We have this small view of the eternal kingdom. You know, you just need to know right now that we're not going to be sitting on a cloud playing a harp for all eternity, okay? That's not, and maybe that's your you know, perception. And maybe, and give me, that is a peaceful perspective, right? I mean, it might be nice to do that for a while, right? I mean, just to be able to play the harp would be kind of cool, right? But, you know, you know, if your life is chaos, you kind of go, oh, man, I could get into that, you know, sitting on a cloud, cloud all day, you know, just strumming. But that is not heaven, okay? Heaven is going to be filled with adventure, filled with excitement and fun. We're going to be able to, we're going to be able to work, actually, in heaven. It's not like works, we're going to do, you know, but it's going to be the work that we love to do. You know, it's those times at work where you kind of come home from the end of the day, you go, oh man, what a great day, we accomplished so much. That's going to be the kind of feeling of work in heaven. We're going we're gonna to do all kinds of things. We're going to be involved with all kinds of stuff. We're going to be in relationships with people. It's going to be filled with fun and joy and relationship and work and purposeful and adventurous. It is not just some place where we sit around in a pew and raise our hands and worship God all day long. And I'm not saying that that's not, we're going to be worshiping him. But if you know anything about worship, worship is not just singing. Worship is a whole life. And we will be worshiping God 24-7, but it'll be in living out that life, not sitting in a worship service just singing. So we need the glove that God gives, the knowledge of this eternal kingdom. And when we understand that, it brings reasons for praise and worship of God, but it encourages us. And it rec we recognize that that's what's going to help us to get through this. Without that understanding of eternity, we fall into depression and despair. Next, God gives us community in the form of the church. He gives us each other. See, see again, we, we are not alone. We have people who are in this world, in this battle, you know, on the field with us, who are on our team, who are, who are working with us, who are helping us, who are supporting us, who are loving us, who are caring for us, and who we can care for and who, who we can love. You know, see, so often, you know, we, we, you know God, is a, God is an amazing God who has the ability to communicate to us in very personal ways that no one else can. A speak a word to our heart or to our minds that just will, will allow us great peace and great joy and great just amazing just worship of him because of what he can do for us personally. But it is also a beautiful tool that God uses when he uses his people, his family members. You know, when you walk in after a long day, a long week, and you walk into the church on a Sunday morning, and you're kind of depressed, and you're feeling down because it's been such a bad week, and you've just been praying all week, God, help me get through this week, and somehow you got through, and, but you're still just, you, uh, tomorrow is Monday, I'm going to have to go back and do this again, and I don't see it getting any better. I mean, sometimes you just need somebody to wrap their arms around you, and you say, God, would you please just comfort me and care for me, and then someone like Jackie walks and reaches you at the door and wraps her arms around you and loves on you and hugs you. You guys, that is the arms of God wrapping around you. We need each other. We need that tactile contact. We need that word from God that comes from a brother or sister in Christ. So when community, the way that community is expressed is, of course, through relationship, right? It's about developing that relationship with one another. It's about caring for each other, about, about loving each other unconditionally, that, that we would 
Yeah, I, I want to talk about this passage, this verse. It talks about uh, uh, that love covers a multitude of sins. Here, here's the deal. I think this is what that means. At least part of what that means. When we come in to the church or when we meet with a fellow brother or sister in Christ and we tell them, confess to them some of the sin that we're struggling with, and then that person hears it, <laughs> forgives us, and then continues to love us, even though they now know <laughs> our failure, it's a beautiful thing. It, it, it's that love that covers the sin, that we recognize that we're not rejected by God, that we're accepted unconditionally. And, and we, can, we can get that when we come together. If we're willing to confess to one another, if we're willing to open up our lives to one another and share and walk this journey together, we can experience that love that will wash over those sins. So we do it through relationship, but I think we also see this expressed in just the strength that we garner from being together. You know, it's been a rough week. You come in, and you're with people that you now trust, people that you know we're all on the same team. We all got the same uniform on, right? And so we're able to kind of interact with one another, and we can strategize together, but we can just be encouraged, right? It, you know, so often, I, I know I've had many times in my life, I come into the doors of the church on a Sunday morning, and, I, you know, I'm kind of defeated, and I'm kind of down, but then by the end of the service... By the end of that couple of hours that I've been there, I walk out the door all fired up and ready to go for the day, right? For the week that, that God has just restored me and encouraged me and given me what I need, the strength and the, and the motivation in order to continue the battle. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Folks, we've got people to help us up. It's the church. You know, it's the family of God that we have here that we need to spend time with. So this is obviously the uniform that God gives us. That, that we would, when we're on the field, we'd be able to look around and, and be encouraged that we're not alone on the field. You know, that when we're out there in the, in, in the world, right, and we're doing our thing, that we can look around and see, you know what, there's other people on my team around me who can, I can go to and who can help me and who are going to support me. And I don't have to do it all. There's, you know, somebody in right field doing their job and somebody in left field doing their job, and I, I just got this little section I've got to care about. But also it's from the dugout, too. When we come to the dugout, and then we talk about the plays that we've done or maybe the failures that we've had and we can encourage one another. It's the uniform. It's knowing that we're all on the same team. When we walk through the doors of the church and into the dugout here, we, we can just enjoy each other and, and, and have a good time together and encourage one another. But we have to, we have to choose to engage in community. And, and this is where sometimes we, we stumble here. and We don't enjoy the full benefit of what God has given us. Because we have to choose relationship. We have to open up our homes. And, and I mean literally open up our homes. You know, that's a, that's, a, that's a kind of a risky thing for some of us, right? You know, you don't, you don't want to open, invite somebody to your house because, you know, maybe you're not the you know, best housekeeper or whatever, and so maybe things are a little bit, you know, awry and, you know, not in place or whatever. Or maybe you're a real clean freak, right? And so, you're, you know, going to come over and you don't want anybody to touch my stuff, you know, because you're going to put fingerprints on it, right? You know, I, you know, I don't know. It's going to be a risky thing, but... but if we're going to be in a relationship, we need to open up our homes to each other. That we would invite each other over because there is something vulnerable about that. That we would actually say, you know what, yes, you can come and I'm going to allow you to see into my world a little bit. I'm going to allow you to see a little bit of who I am and the, and, and the character that I have and the personality I have and the, and the way I live. But it's through that vulnerability that relationship can go deep. You know, I've just recently, uh, you know, so I've been here eight months now and, uh, and, and Reading and, and at TAC, and it's been amazing. You guys are awesome, and you're loving on me and my wife really well, and we just love the relationships we're developing. But uh, a month ago or so, I was kind of lonely. I, I just found myself, being an extrovert, I'm not used to that feeling, right? I'm used to always kind of having relationships and kind of doing that thing. And, but it, it was weird. I just, I, I was feeling this loneliness. And so I started praying about it, and I talked to my mentor about it a little bit, and and I, I think what, we, what the Lord brought out in those conversations was that I didn't have anybody that I'd 
dove into relationship with yet. And, and you know, it's, it's typical, right? You get to a new place and you're not really sure kind of who you can trust and who you can't trust. And maybe, maybe in a little bit different way for pastors too, just because, you know, there's a lot of other things that go on than just relationship and politics and stuff. And um, so I was, I was actually holding off. And so what I felt convicted about is that I needed to dive in. And so uh, I did that about a month ago, and the Lord is just refreshing my soul through it. I don't feel lonely anymore. And not much, is, not much has happened in my life. Not, not much has changed, but I've just chosen to go ahead and dive in, even though, you know, I don't know if I can trust this person or not fully. I mean, I don't know him that well. I'm just getting to know him. But I'm just, I've chosen to d- dive in, to be vulnerable, to open up my life and my heart to them and, and you know, see what happens. And they've responded well, so praise the Lord to them too. You know, thank you for that. So we need to we need to engage. The greatest joys that we will ever experience in this life will always be in relationship. You know, a party is not a party unless there's at least one other person in the room, right? <laughs> Hang some streamers, get the music going, disco ball, bow, 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 bow. Yeah, we're going to have a good time, right? <laughs> but you're by yourself, eh, not so fun, right? The greatest joys we're ever going to experience in this life are always going to be experienced in community. Finally, God uh, also gives us power. He provides what we need for the fight that we're in. Again, we are not alone. His Spirit goes with us. (laughs) Here's the thing. We have the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead. It's not just like some little kind of, you know, second class spirit, right? It's not like, you know, some spirit that, you know, just barely got born and just kind of, you know, is kind of new to this whole spirit thing and it's not really sure how it all works. And, you know, he hasn't, you know, figured out, you know, how strong he really is, you know. No, no, we got a full grown, mature spirit, right? It's the spirit of Jesus. We have that same spirit. We've been given power to endure and to handle and to win the victories in this world that need to be won. And we see that displayed, that power displayed in a couple of pretty obvious reasons, or ways. One is our gifts and abilities and our talents. The things that we just are born with. All of us have it. All of us have, you know, either just a, you know, an amazing personality or a, a, an amazing ability to communicate or an amazing ability to think about deep things or an amazing ability to, 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 to paint or to draw or to, you know, I don't know, Jackie, what do you do? I mean, it's just amazing what you do. But anyway, she's, she's super artsy, right? I mean, she's amazing. Uh, but, you know, we all have talents. We all have abilities. It's natural things that we're born with that we can do. And all of those things are, come from God, right? They're not ours. It's not something we can call, oh, look at me, I'm so great. No, it's not anything about it. We were given that by God, right? And so that is the power that he has given us in order to survive this world, to make it through this world. This, is the, the, this power, these abilities, these talents that he's given us are so that we can love evil people. That, that's why he's given it to us, right? We can love good people too, but we can love evil people. That's, that's why we have that. Those are the tools that we need in order to continue to do good. But he also gives us special empowerments. These special empowerments go well beyond what we could naturally ever do. They're sometimes considered to be supernatural or spiritual gifts a manifestation of the Spirit as He comes and gives us what we need at right the moment, at right, at right the, <laughs> at just the right moment. There's the J word I was looking for. At just the right moment, just enough to do His will. But you know the thing about the special empowerments; they only come after we take a step of faith. They only come after we make the choice. That we're going to go. So God comes and he says, hey, I want you to go and talk to this person. I don't know what to say to that person. I don't even know that person. I'm not going to do that. Okay, well, then you don't get the special empowerment. God says, go and talk to this person. 
Say, okay, God, I have no idea what I'm going to say, but okay, I'll go talk to him. Open up their mouth, boom, the words come out. God says, go pray for that person. I don't know what to pray for that person. How am I supposed to pray for that? I, I've never even experienced what they're experiencing right now. There's, I have nothing to add to that conversation. Just go pray for them. You go. You get what you need to pray the prayer that needs to be prayed that will bring encouragement to the person you're praying for and to your own soul. And God's power is revealed. We have to take the step of faith in order to get there. Of course, the power of God is the baseball bat that he gives us. And it's our own gifts and abilities that allows us to make the, hit those base, hit, base hits. Right? Our own talents, our own natural abilities that we've been given, that, that's how we can hit, just keep in the game. You know, I bloop second base, bloop over second base, bloop over, you know, I never hit a line drive anywhere. It was, everything was a little bloop, right? You know, bloop over second base, bloop over second base, <laughs> and then run real fast. And then, oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> you're, like, you're such a weenie. Why are you hitting so weak? You know, come on, hit the ball hard. Anyway, no, I can't do that. Anyway, so, yeah, but that's, it's a natural talents, abilities that we have, you know, to just kind of get those base hits. But when it comes to the home runs, right? That's where we need that supernatural power to come in. You know, you get a, I, I never hit a home run in my life. <clears throat> Swing really hard. Bloop, second base. <laughs> yeah, not, not one. I mean, what a great joy that is to hit a home run. I, I, I imagine it's great, but I've never hit a home run. Like over the fence where you can drop the bat and you kind of do that strut, you know, run around the bases. Yeah, that's right. I hit it over the fence, man. I'm bad. No, no, never experienced that. <sighs> At least not in the real physical baseball game. But in the spiritual world, I certainly can, right? Because God gives us the power to hit the home runs. So when we have that power, when we understand that power, when we put our trust in the power that God has given us, we have confidence. We can walk in confidence and boldness through this life. We as Christians do not have to walk out the doors of this church and worry about what's coming next. We don't have to worry about what evil thing is going to happen or what tragedy is going to happen or where the next you know, you know, thing is going to come that's going to just ruin my life. We don't have to walk through that way. Matter of fact, we shouldn't walk through life that way. When we understand that we have the power of God, no matter what comes to us, He knows it's coming and He will provide the power we need to get through it. There are some that believe that God will never give us more than we can handle, and that is not true. God will give us more than we can handle so that we can trust in Him. God will never tempt us beyond what we can resist. But God will give us more than we handle, can handle at times. Life will give us more than we can handle at times. But we do not have to fear. We do not have to kind of walk around like this waiting for it to come. We can walk with confidence and boldness knowing that we're walking with the Spirit and that He is going to give us whatever we need, whatever comes, for whatever comes. 2 Timothy 1.7, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid. doesn't make us afraid. But it gives us power and love and self-discipline. We need to be taking steps of faith. And I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk about examples of God's power that we see throughout Scripture. First of all, Gideon. Gideon was not a general. Okay, Gideon didn't know anything about how to fight a battle or to lead a, an army into battle. But God said, hey, I want you to go and be a general. I want you to lead my army into battle. Gideon said, all right. God gave him courage. God gave Gideon courage to go and take 300 guys up against an army of over 100,000 soldiers. You know, God gives the same kind of courage to missionaries who go into Muslim countries where it's illegal to be a Christian where they could lose their life if somebody found out that they were a Christian. The same kind of courage is still around today. God is continuing to give and empower people with courage to step into places that are filled with danger. Joseph. God gave Joseph the ability to interpret dreams, right? I mean, from early on, you know, 
poor Joseph, Joseph, you know, I mean, he just had these dreams. I mean, it wasn't really his fault that, you know, he's telling his brothers about the dreams and they, you know, kind of got mad about it and sold him into slavery. Yeah, it was his fault. He shouldn't have said anything. But anyway, God gave Joseph the ability to interpret dreams. Okay, but then it comes down to it later in his life and Pharaoh has this dream and no one can interpret it. And, and, and Joseph says, I'll, I'll, I'll walk up there. And somebody comes to him and says, hey, Joseph, I hear you can interpret dreams. He goes, well, I can't interpret dreams, but God can and he will interpret it for us. He walked in, even though he could have lost his life, right? <laughs> Pharaoh could have said, you know what, that, that, you're screwy. That's not, that's not what the interpretation is. But he took a step of faith, and God once again interpreted the dream. This same thing is happening with many Muslims and Muslim missionary, or missionaries in Muslim countries right now, where they're having dreams of Jesus. And God is helping them to understand that that dream they're having is Jesus. And they're turning and giving their life to Christ as a result. Moses, <laughs> Moses, man, he had, he had all kinds of excuses, right? He couldn't do anything. <laughs> but God gave him faith, right? I mean, you think about it. All that's going on, you know, Moses did have to actually go to Egypt. I mean, it was, it was you know, a several-day journey. It wasn't like it was just, you know, next door. So Moses had to walk that whole way to Egypt. Every step he took was a step of faith. And then imagine standing before Pharaoh and saying, oh, um, so yeah, uh, since you're not going to let our people go, the Nile's going to turn to blood. Yeah, go ahead and tell that to somebody today, right? Before it happens. It wasn't like he came in afterwards saying, you know, uh, uh, yeah, the, the Nile's going to turn to blood, you know, that kind of thing, you know, after it happens. No, before it happened, over and over again, he spoke it out. He had faith. I have a friend of mine, her name's Rachel, she's... I think uh, one of the people that, I, uh, that has the greatest faith that I know, I think. And she's a young gal that has felt called to missions, and, and she doesn't have the typical missions uh, kind of personality and maybe skills and, and, and abilities. And so she hasn't made it on to the field full time, but she's done a lot of short-term stuff. And I tell you, she has been several times to places that no young lady should ever go alone. But she has gone because God has given her faith to take that step and to go wherever he leads. It's amazing. Peter. Okay, Peter, he's just an average guy. This crazy thing of fire comes down, <laughs> steps out. Oh my gosh, he can speak in all these different languages. Right? I mean, God gave him the power to communicate the gospel message in the mother tongues of all of the people that were represented in that city at that day, at that time. Amazing, right? Just out of the blue. God just said, you know, here you go. We uh, saw an example of this just recently. Uh, Tajikistan, right? Chris, missionary that was visiting a couple weeks ago. Here's a guy that's got the gift of tongues, right? Gift of languages, right? God has given him the ability to speak three or four different languages, and he continues to learn them. New ones. That's not just something that comes along every day. Empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Paul. Paul was, I mean, Paul was an amazing evangelist. Hey, think about that. I mean, that's all he did is he went around city to city to city, and he had this, God gave him this amazing ability and empowerment to be able to understand the culture that he was preaching to and to be able to take the gospel message that he knew so well and be able to fit it into that culture so that they would understand it. I mean, I have a hard enough time, you know, getting up here and trying to figure out who you guys are and how to make it so it makes sense to you, and you oftentimes it doesn't even make sense to me, right? You know, but Paul, he's just bouncing around. He doesn't even know these people. He doesn't have relationships with them. He just walks in, and he's able to read the signs of the cult. God, that is the Holy Spirit giving him the ability to evangelize. Sounds like a guy named Billy Graham, who unfortunately just, well, maybe fortunately just left this side of heaven. So the point is, guys, is that we've got these, God gives us this stuff. You know, so often we look at the stories of the Bible and we go, oh, that's just back then. It was different people, different time. You know, God doesn't work that way anymore. No, come on. Can we reject that? And recognize that God is still a God of power. That the Spirit is still working and active in this world. And certainly we have natural abilities and talents that He's given us, and we need to use that to bring glory to His name. But there's also more out there for us if we're willing to take steps of faith. 
When God calls us, he will provide what we need. Stop worrying about whether or not I can do it and start worrying about whether God has called me to it, right? And that we, you know, we miss out on so much of God's power because we say, well, whoa, 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 that can't be God because I'm not skilled in that area. It can't be God because I have nothing in common with that person. It can't be God. You know what? We, over and over again, we just say it can't be God. Instead of saying, you know what? God's, I feel like this is the way I got to go and try it and see what happens and see how God provides what we need at right the right time, at just the right time. I still can't get just right. Anyway. That's just God humbling me like he always does. That's good. All right. Worship team, go ahead and come forward. Just a kind of final thought. The reality is that we have a God who gives us, uh, he gives us power. He gives us community. And he gives us knowledge of the future. And these are the tools that we need to survive in this world that we're living in right now. This is how we're going to make it through this battle we're in. These are the things that we have to lean on, but when we understand we have them, cause us to bring glory to God's name. It encourages us and helps us to go, yeah, we can do this. But second of all, it causes us to worship God because he has not left us alone. He has not just given us some impossible mission to do. He has, he has given us what we need. He's given us the knowledge. He's given us the community. He's given us the power to make it through this world. He's given us a glove. He's given us a jersey. He's given us the bat so that we can win this game and eventually enter the eternal kingdom where there will be rest. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's stand and continue to worship.